Welcome to Taking the Leap into Commercial Real Estate, the number one podcast dedicated to helping you get comfortable in the commercial real estate arena and equipping you with the latest market news, insights, and strategies you need to make informed decisions about investing. Now, let's get into today's episode with your host, Angel and Brittany Gonzalez and John Jerry. All right, everyone, welcome back to Taking a Leap into Commercial Real Estate. Today, we are honored to have our guest, Mark Updegraff, joining us today. I'm your host, Angel Gonzalez, as well as my co-host, Brittany Gonzalez and Jen Gary. Uh, so we're going to have the opportunity to get a chance to know Mark here. And so I'm going to kick us off right off the bat here, asking him the tough questions. No, I'm just kidding. Um, So right off the bat there, Mark, can you uh, please introduce yourself and uh, describe a little bit about what you do and, and how you come about your space that you're in? Sure. My name is uh, Mark Updegraff. I came up to Rochester, New York from central Pennsylvania to go to RIT, Rochester Institute of Technology. I convinced my high school sweetheart to come up to Rochester uh, and go to U of R. and uh, We've just fell in love with the town. It was the right size for us. It wasn't too big. It wasn't too small. And you know, I went through. I got my undergraduate bachelor's of science. I worked in industry a little bit. I wasn't quite happy with how much I was making, so went back to school, got another degree, an advanced degree. Came back, attacked the job force again. Still wasn't super happy with how much I was making, but you know, cost of living in Rochester is pretty cheap, so I wasn't complaining. But what I had done when I was in school was I'd read up on real estate, right? I knew that I've always been entrepreneurial and I knew that I wanted to get into some sort of passive investment and real estate really just checked all the boxes I was looking for. And so during that process of getting my advanced degree, I started buying some rentals at the same time. And while I was working in industry, I was probably up to like maybe six or seven units, something like that, a handful self-managing. And uh, unfortunately, my company that I worked for lost this legacy contract with the Department of Defense. It's five hundred million dollar contract they had every year, and uh, when they lost it, they had to lay off two thousand people. So you know, last in, first out. Of course, I was one of those two thousand people that got laid off, and everybody that got laid off was an imaging scientist. So finding work as an imaging person in Rochester at the same time Kodak was laying off, Bosch and Loam was laying off, Xerox was laying off all imaging jobs. I told my wife, look, if you want me to stay in the field that I've studied and got these degrees in, we got to move out of Rochester. And she says to me, well, what are you going to do with these rentals? You know, you, you bought these properties. They're not liquid. Uh, we'd have to have somebody manage them. And so, you know, I shopped around for, for managers, never really found any company that I trusted with my units. And I went to my wife and I said, I've got this crazy idea. Why don't I get a real estate license? You know, my agent was not servicing me the way that I had hoped he would. You know, he wasn't responsive enough. It was a time in the marketplace where you could still be the early bird and get the worm, right? So if I saw a good deal, it penciled out, the pro forma looked good, I could go write a clean contract and I could take it down, I could add it to the portfolio. Uh, so I said, I'm just going to do that so I don't lose these opportunities. And she said, well, you know, you still got to pay your bills. So you can't just run around buying investment properties if you don't have any money coming in. I said, yes, I understand that, honey. So I will try to be a salesperson. And she just looked at me like I was nuts because I had always just been like, I hate salespeople. I hate realtors. I, you know, they're, they're, they're horrible. They're just, they're too salesy. Uh, but luckily I had this construction background from doing my first six rentals that were kind of like value add properties where I would buy distressed, bring them up to speed with a couple of my buddies. Um, so I had that good construction background on how a house was put together. And when I'd walk clients through houses that were retail buyers, I'd educate them. And instead of like trying to trick them into buying some house, I'd say, Hey, actually, this isn't the best house for you. Let's find you another house. And so I was getting really good positive feedback from the people that I had serviced saying like, Hey, we really liked working with you. And they would start to bring me some referrals. Uh, but I wasn't doing enough business where I could pay the bills and continue to invest in real estate. So I, I really needed to amp up my sales. And at the same time, I was helping investors purchase investment properties. Uh, they were, you know, they were coming just acquaintances that I made through sites like Bigger Pockets. Um, and they were interested in the Rochester market. So I was helping them and they needed management services. Uh, so you know, knowing that there wasn't a good manager in town, that's when I decided to open a management shop where not only could my units get serviced correctly, I could service units for other people as well. Uh, so over the last 15 years, I've been just building this full service experience uh, in the in the field of real estate, you know whether you're a retail buyer just looking for your first house, or you're a seasoned investor uh, looking for a large multifamily, 
uh, we, we're like cradle to grave. We can help you. And we've even integrated the construction services as well because that was one of the components that we couldn't control. And we realized early on that you know our clients, they need to know how much a roof is going to cost. They need to know how much windows are going to cost. So having that expertise in-house allowed us to not have to uh, train our agents to find vendors to get these quotes. They could just call our in-house person and generate bids for them on the fly. Uh, so that was especially helpful working with new buyers that might want a kitchen, they might want a roof, but then also investors that want to do burrs and stuff like that. Uh, so that's that's me in a nutshell. Wow. <laughs> I, you definitely, I say, took the leap, right? You were taking an avenue and taking a different path. And I'd, I'd even ask you, how'd you convince your wife to make you to be able to get that to... Happen. Yeah, she, she she trusts me. Uh, you know, she I've always been um, entrepreneurial, and so like I've had side hustles in the past where you know you, you make money, but you do a lot of work, and sometimes you're just kind of inventing yourself a job. So she knows that I'm a hard worker. Uh, she knows that I'm you know creative and industrious. And with the the six rental properties that we had, you know, I I showed her proof of concept with the cash flow. And now we weren't going to get rich overnight. It's it's a really slow process. You build like maybe a hundred bucks a door. Uh, in true cash flow after you've budgeted for your capex, your vacancy, your bad debt, and any other you know things that are going to go into these rentals, you're not making a ton of money. But she knew my end goal was to stack those units up. So when we retire, you know we've got a passive source of income. Um, and then you know, luckily the sales just came naturally. I, I basically told her, look, if I if I stink at sales, then I'll just we'll move. You know, we'll figure it out. I'll get a job in imaging, and and that'll be that. Uh, but luckily, she trusted me to to take that avenue. And I'll tell you, I was never on somebody's team. I didn't have a mentor in the real estate field or, or for sales. I went in. My landlord, when I was in college, was a broker. Uh, so I, I went in to see him and I said, Hey, I just got my license. Can I hang it here? He said, yes, yeah, yeah, you can hang it here. He's like, come on a team. You know, We're only going to take half of your, your commission for every sale that you ever do. I'm like, I don't really want to... I can't afford to live if you're taking half my my commission. Uh, so I politely declined the offer. I went with like a Remax franchise, which they give most of the commission back to the agent. They say take a very small fee. You pay a desk fee, right? So it cost me about twelve grand a year to be at a Remax. But when I did the math, if I was going to be successful in my career, it it would pay me more money to be at that kind of organization. So I took the leap of faith, and uh, luckily, I was good at sales. And which, when people ask me like, "Well, how are you good at sales? Like, what's the secret?" There is no secret. Like, you just do your job. You answer the phone. If somebody has a question, you get back to them. It's like ping pong. Like if I get something at me, I got to volley it back. That's the only secret, right? Just take mm-hmm. care of people like you'd want to be taken care of and the rest is going to work itself out. And that's an amazing story, Mark. So, you know, I hear it so many times in this industry, it's almost the opposite where people are, you know, in a comfortable cush career that they're looking to kind of make the change and they don't know when the time is going to work out to their favor. You know, for you, it seems quite the opposite where it's kind of forced upon you and turned out to be you know, a very good opportunity. What I'm curious to know is at what point along your career in, in, in real estate now, did you feel like you knew you had made it? Like you had made the career successfully, uh, made the change successfully and that it was a viable option for you going forward. You weren't going to have to go back to imaging. Yeah, that's a really good question. Really good question. I don't think there... I don't I don't even know if I've had that moment yet. Like, right? like <laughs> I've been doing it for 15 years and I wouldn't say that I've ever had that moment of clarity where I'm like, yeah, I made it. You know, because you're always expanding. You're always growing. Um, mm-hmm. you know, on the property management side, you know, it's a thankless job and there's a lot of overhead in it. And because I want to have superior service and, you know, my, my units are there too. So I need to make sure my units are cared for. You really don't make any money on property management. So it's not like that was a profit center when we set that up. In fact, it was, it was a loss leader for a long time. Uh, so when did I figure it out? I would tell you that I just kept plugging away and I knew that as long as I didn't, go crazy on overhead and I kept it at a moderate amount, I could continue to operate. Right. So our first office was my house. And so I hired, you know, had one or two people on payroll. We operated out of a room in the back of my house. We kept our overhead down. It wasn't until we had the cash flow to go move into an office space that we actually took that leap into the space. So we just kind of grew slowly, always being cautious about how much money we were spending. The first office we went into was very tiny. And it had one little bathroom and um, it was maybe a 10 foot by 12 foot space. It was like the size of a bedroom, but it gave us some commercial exposure. There was nice glass windows in the front and it was a really walkable neighborhood. Uh, so we had people coming in off the street talking to us and we started to generate leads just based on our 
our commercial presence, which was awesome. And that, that was kind of like an aha moment. Uh, but we had about 15 people working out of that one room. Like we had one table and everybody had a laptop around it. Uh, so it was hard to, you know, talk on the phone and get work done. Uh, but I stayed there probably longer than I should have just to really make sure that I could afford to take that next step into a more expensive commercial space. Man, you're, no, I can appreciate you sharing all that. And I, and I will ask then, I mean, from a skills standpoint, I know you kind of briefly touched on it, but what kind of skills do you feel like for you to have the success that you're having currently? What do you think that are, are the are the ones that have been most practical or more important for your side of things? Yeah. So on the property management side, you know, each market's going to be a little bit different, but for our marketplace and for our fee structure, we're at like 150 units is, is probably where you got to be to be able to hire somebody and have them on payroll full time and be able to operate as a manager. Until you hit that number of units, you, you're going to have more overhead than you have revenue. So you're going to be subsidizing your business a little bit. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the first critical point that we hit in our business was getting up to that 150 units. And then as you scale your unit counts, you know, you're going to get to a point where your people are complaining that there's too much work and they need help. Right? So you always got to balance your incoming revenue with your, uh, your payroll. And you know, as you add a person, that's a pretty significant, significant expense. So towards the end of it, you've got people crying that they need more help, but you really got to just listen to them cry until you can afford that person and put them on payroll. And then things are easy again. And then as you build your unit count, it gets hard again and you need another person. So it's just kind of... Uh, you you got to listen to people, but you got to know your numbers. Mm. As you've explained it, you said you've been doing it for about 15 years and a lot of things have taken place. What would you say is the biggest thing that's evolved or changed throughout your career? Well, I've watched the window of opportunity for real estate investment just shrink and shrink and shrink. And now um, we're back in this weird part of the cycle where everybody's wondering what's going to happen, right? So in 08, luckily, I started after that that huge correction and it was buy, buy, buy. Everybody was scared to death to buy anything. And so that meant you could walk around, you could cherry pick what deals you wanted, you could negotiate with sellers, and you could get real sweetheart deals. And, you know, as people started to realize like, oh, wow, this is a great time to be buying real estate, the returns just shrank and shrank and shrank. Um, and they're still shrinking today. So we're, we're almost at a, this weird inflection point. And, um, you know, I think it's, it's going to be interesting moving forward for the people that, you know, have that experience riding multiple cycles that they can be ready for it. Um, and there's probably some people who are, who got caught up in the bull run and did some risky stuff and maybe they've got some adjustable rates that are going to be turning over. They're over leveraged. Uh, they're, maybe they're going to do capital calls and their investors aren't going to want to throw good money uh, onto bad. So I think we're in a, a really unique time in the marketplace for uh, new entrepreneurs and uh, seasoned entrepreneurs to take advantage of some real estate discounts. It'd be nice if we get back to that season again sort of soon. We're all hoping for that. So, mm -hmm. Mark, along your journey, have you had any mentors or professional guidance that you look back upon that was significant in your career? Yeah. So, my family's not in real estate, but my father's an entrepreneur. So, I've got him as kind of like my business figurehead who I can always turn to and ask him questions about personnel, hiring, firing, benefits, uh, you know, stuff like that. On the real estate side, um, I was an early adopter to Bigger Pockets. And so I'm sure you guys know about it and your audience, I'm sure, is familiar with the site. Uh, back in the early inception of it, you know, I was a newbie. And so I was coming in and I was asking a lot of questions. And I made relationships with a lot of people that were very experienced in different uh, areas of the country and then also different asset classes uh, with different strategies, you know, from wholesalers to fix and flippers to large multifamily investors. And I built a good Rolodex of people that I could talk to when I had a question that I needed answered that I couldn't get an answer somewhere else. And it wasn't like I'd be pestering them all the time, but I did build that relationship to the point where, you know, if I needed something, I could reach out to them and I could get the answer. Uh, so just luckily, you know, through that type of networking, and I'm sure you can still do it today. There's people that like to pay it forward. And you know they're there. They might not be super active on the site. Uh, but maybe you'll find a comment that they made whenever, a couple years ago. And it seems like the kind of person that's got the knowledge that you're seeking to attain. Uh, so just you know, starting to make friendship, build that relationship. Um, that's been huge, honestly. 
Well, another question I would have for you, um, Mark, is what would be some of the valuable lessons that you've learned along the way that have helped you navigate um, some of the challenges in your career? Oh, so many lessons. Where to start, right? <laughs> My father's oh, got all these uh, euph <laughs> euphemisms that he, he likes to, to tell me all the time. You know, one of them is like, you've always got somebody coming and going in your organization. So, you know, one of the key things that I do now is like, I'm always looking for talent. When I first started out, it's like, okay, I need to hire somebody. We put the ad out, we'd interview, we'd find somebody, we'd hire them. Now I just advertise all the time, whether I need somebody or not, because what I want to get is I want to get that gem every once in a while. And if I'm not looking all the time, it's just reducing my odds of finding that person, right? If I'm only searching for somebody when I need them, then what if this awesome person was searching when I wasn't looking? So having that constant marketing for people coming in, getting that top talent, and when you identify the top talent, take them. Right? It's going to be a little bit of a leap of faith. Uh, you might not know exactly what they're going to do, but the chances are they're going to run circles around a couple people in your organization, uh, and it's going to become pretty apparent who should be doing what. And then you might even you know need to let somebody go, or somebody. Oftentimes, people just leave because they realize that like they probably weren't the right person for that job. And when mm -hmm. the new talent comes in, they they realize it even more, and they they just start looking because they're they're no longer they're no longer in that position of authority because they can kind of tell that they just don't have that experience that the other person brings to the table. So Mark, have you had any interesting or unique uh, challenges in your career that you can draw back upon that uh, you look back on as uh, that you've learned an important lesson from? And can you kind of walk us through that experience? Yeah. I mean, I've learned through the school of hard knocks. I try to avoid as many mistakes as possible, but you know, I've made countless mistakes. So, you know, anything from foreclosure investing, there's no there's no uh, school on how to invest in foreclosures. You just kind of got to figure it out through your trusted professionals. Uh, so the first foreclosure that I bought, I thought, you know, I thought like a lot of people do, you just walk in and you buy the foreclosure and everything's clear. Well, no, that's not the case. Uh, you've got to run title. So now I enlist a, a title company through my attorney to run title and let me know if there's going to be things that aren't cut off or if there's any special conditions. So on one of these, on my first foreclosure that I purchased, there was an IRS right of redemption. Now an IRS right of redemption gives the IRS the ability to come take the property from you, sell it, and then they've got to return your original capital, right? So if I spent a hundred grand, they got to give me the hundred grand back, but now I'm out of pocket waiting for 90 days. And, you know, if they choose to redeem it, I get my hundred grand back, but I still have all my, you know, my lost cost of having my capital tied up for, for 90 days. I can't improve the property during that 90 days because if they do redeem, they can sell it. And now I've lost any improvements that I made to it. They're only going to give me my original investment back. So my first one that I bought, I was like, oh, crap. Um, so I, I talked to a few people and they're all like, oh, we've never even had the IRS call us or anything. I'm like, no, they, they literally called me. They set up an appointment. They want to come see the house. So I was kind of freaking out. I was like, man, maybe they're actually going to redeem. So I just had to sit on it for 90 days. And this is back in the beginning of my career. Like I didn't, that was all my capital. You know, I, and so the coding costs, you know, and I'm just like, oh man. So that was a learning lesson. Um, you could also buy wrong positions. I've never done that. And luckily, like when that happened, I got really educated on uh, what to do on the foreclosure process. And I try to educate other people now too, but you'll go into these auctions and there'll be people that show up that they clearly haven't done the research on title. And so I'll know that there's like another 80 grand in stuff that's not cut off that the, the buyer's going to have to pay. And they'll just bid the property up like two, maybe two or three people don't know what's going on. They'll just bid it up to some stupid number. And now when they take it to the attorney, you've got to give your deposit at the sale. So you've got to have certified funds at the auction, uh, either 10 or 25%, depending on the type of uh, auction it is. And now they give it to their attorney. They're like, Hey, I bought this foreclosure. The attorney's like, okay, well, you got to pay another 80 grand on top of that. They're like, what? They're like, yeah. <laughs> And uh, if you don't want to do it, you just lost your deposit. So there goes your 10 or 25% of whatever your high bid was to walk away. Uh, so there's a lot uh, in the foreclosure space that I've learned over the years. Um, I've learned other hard lessons. Um, don't work with the union, which my father said, don't work with the union. I thought <laughs> they, pro they promised me, oh, scalability, excellent quality of people. You know, they gave me drug addicts and alcoholics that had no work ethic. And uh, that were liars and cheaters and stealers. So, you know, I learned I learned that lesson the hard way. Um, so many lessons. Most people are are good, 
and, and honest people. So I tell a lot of people that are getting into business, like 99% of my relationships are fantastic. There's only like, there's like one rotten apple every once in a while that comes through and that can re- be really deflating. And sometimes it, it, sometimes it can lead to some of these stories, but as long as you don't let it get you down, you keep moving forward, you learn your lessons from your mistakes, you're going to be fine. Well, that's a, that's a great way of putting it too. But yeah, the, the people that you uh, surround yourself do matter though, right? So, um, so let me, let me ask you this. So when you're looking at what's a, a successful investment, what are some of the key characteristics or factors that you take into account when you kind of decide what's successful? With that? Mm-hmm. I'm a location centric investor. So for me, location is paramount because it's the only thing that I can't change about that investment. Mm-hmm. I'm stuck with it, right? So that's going to be my number one driving factor behind all of my buy decisions. Um, and then after that, it would be cash flow, right? That's a great answer. So, Mark, you talked a little bit about the the challenge of the industry when you kind of first came in, and you know how the macro environment kind of relates to everything that we're doing here. What do you see as some of the challenges that lie ahead of us in the industry, and and um, you know kind of what's your five five year outlook here? Yeah, so there's all kinds of interesting things happening, right? So, I think. Um, People that have started funds, I think that's it's a newer phenomenon, right? There's a lot of regulations that have changed that have opened up people's ability to start funds, have funds, and invest in, in real estate through fund of funds and, and and specific offerings. So there's I think there's been a lot of, you know, less experienced operators that have been dabbling in the space. And, you know, during the bull market, I'm sure they did really good. Uh, but I'm sure there was also a lot of risky underwriting. And uh, you know, you've got companies like BlackRock that have bought up massive amounts of single family homes for rentals. You know, I've got a colleague that works for an underwriting company down south and he tells me like what's happening with these with these deals like so the the black rocks of the world would hire third party underwriters and those underwriters were so slammed because everybody was trying to buy as much real estate as possible that you know they were hiring like 20 somethings coming out of college that had no experience underwriting they were getting trained by like 25 year olds that had little experience underwriting and uh, they bought a lot of properties and they paid too much for them and mm-hmm. they thought that the rents were going to be significantly higher than they are uh, now they're still holding on to those properties but what are they, are they going to hold on to them forever? Are they going to dump them? And then you've got you know the, the short-term market, the short-term rental market that's become explosive as far as popularity goes. You know, doctors used to have their spouse get a real estate license in order to take advantage of that those tax benefits that come with being a real estate professional. Today, all you have to do is buy uh, Airbnb, and now you're qualified, and you could take some of those losses off of your active income. And so uh, Airbnb has just been explosive, not just for doctors, but for everybody, right? Anybody that wants to be able to write off part of their active income wants to have an Airbnb. They want, if they want a trophy property on the lake. They want, you know, and they're being underwritten for these short term leases. They're not sustainable on long term leases. If you aren't getting that short term lease money that you're expecting, if something turns, we go into a deep recession, something like that, those guys are out. They're going to have to dump their products. You've got funds that are going into the space. And you've got certain metros that are just getting so saturated with this type of investment that, I mean, the Phoenix market, if you look at from 2022 to 2023, they've doubled the amount of short-term rentals they've had in one year. And so like, is that sustainable? How are those rents going to look in 2024 after the market's been able to figure out what the true rate is with this increase in supply? How many more units are we going to have from 23 to 24? Is it going to be another 50%, another 100%. So I don't think it's going to be even keel across all areas, but I think certain areas are, uh, there's going to be opportunities in my, in my opinion. Man, that is, a, that is actually a lot of what I, it's interesting. Everything you're reading and seeing, you know, can kind of give you a different perspective as to kind of what the, that outlook looks like. And I think I'm, I think you hit the nail on the head as to what, what that looks like in that market, especially too. But um, for me, I'm going to come and throw a little curveball. I always like to throw it out there and make sure we understand a little bit about um, kind of what your what you would recommend as a good book or a movie, and and we like to know the why. So behind that as well, if you could do that, Brian. Mm-hmm. I really like the Fountainhead. I read that a number of years ago. Um, I'm rereading it again now. It's uh, a book about an architect, but it, there's about five main characters in the book. It's not just about the architect. And it's very thought provoking. You can, you know, parts of each, each personality, you can kind of 
feel like they're inside of you. You like you embody those those characteristics. It's it's a great read. And if you like real estate, you'll like it. So the Fountainhead. Fountainhead, all right. Mm-hmm. I have not read that. Me neither. I feel like we're going to just continue to grab additional knowledge by everybody's books or movies. It's awesome. Um, another question I have for you, Mark, is just our company's motto is faith, family, and giving. These are three things that are um, that resonates very strongly within our team. Um, can you share the impact of one of these areas in your life? Yeah, I was raised a Presbyterian, and um, you know I would like to continue that tradition with my children. My parents uh, were big advocates of getting us involved in, in mission work early on. You know, so I've been to Virginia, done different mission work in the U.S., but then also uh, going down to Honduras to do mission work. Uh, locally here in Rochester, we're advocates for the homeless. So we do a lot of work with St. Joe's House of Hospitality, namely make fundraisers and, and try to generate awareness and generate funds to to help the homeless population here in Rochester. Man, that's, that's great, man. And I can't, can't stress enough, keep that going, man. I think that the more we can give and, and be part of the communities, I mean, that's really some of the high impact stuff that we believe as, as humanity is important. So uh, I can only stress that that's awesome that you're doing that. Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and kind of wrap up our show here shortly here with a couple of final questions. Uh, the first one being, if there is anything that uh, that you can share that we may have missed out on, what would that be if, uh, about you, what you or what you guys are doing? Um, I'm starting a blind fund. So I'll be using my expertise as a uh, foreclosure specialist to be able to acquire assets at a better discount than you'll find in the marketplace. You know, I think a lot of people are waiting for the sellers to, to capitulate to the new interest rates. In my marketplace, that's not happening yet. There's a big bid ask spread. I don't expect that spread is going to change anytime real soon, You know, maybe one to two years. But in the meantime, uh, we had a pause in foreclosures during COVID. And they're, they're just so backed up in quantity. They're coming through at a rate at which you know we're buying stuff at a pretty good discount. So I'm working on a blind fund to be able to acquire foreclosures, you know, specifically in multifamily, um, at a pretty pretty significant discount to to the current value. And that's that's huge. And uh, well, I I definitely think the all encompassing important question is uh, for our audience is how do they find you and and what can you uh, and what are the ways that they can connect with you and your firm. Yeah, probably the best way is just to shoot me a text message. I'm at 585-314-9790, 585-314-9790. You can also find me on LinkedIn or my website is raise capital, R-A-Z-E capital.com. Oh, man, that's great. Well, Mark, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to get us uh, get us the opportunity to get to know you and, and what you're doing. And I think that's incredible that uh, you're taking advantage of some great opportunities out there. And Feel free to loop us in or keep us posted as to some of the ventures that you've got going on. But I just wanted to say thanks for uh, jumping on the show with us today. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me on. Thanks, thanks Mark. Mark. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank you for joining us on the Taking the Leap into Commercial Real Estate Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please take a moment to support us by subscribing and leaving a positive rating and review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And remember, the views and content shared on this podcast do not reflect that of Keystone Private Capital and Keystone Holdings. Creative Planning, LLC, Bergen KDV, Creative Planning, and Keystone Private Capital and Keystone Holdings are separate and distinct companies. Creative Planning is not affiliated with Keystone Private Capital, Keystone Holdings, or any of their affiliated companies and makes no claims, promises, or endorsements of any products offered by Keystone Private Capital and Keystone Holdings. Our views are our own and not those of creative planning. Thank you for tuning in and we'll catch you in the next episode.